So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled 20th Century Fiction where we are looking at James Joyce's Ulysses. So in this very short lecture we will just look at a particular scene from this novel uh, and this is a very important scene It's apparently a very innocuous conversation between the headmaster of the school in which Stephen D. Dallas is teaching and uh, D. Dallas himself. Uh, but this scene is packed with some of the very political things um, and this could be looked from a post colonial perspective and also some of the very anti-Semitic things which Ulysses uh, dramatizes. So the anti-Semitic sentiments in Dublin at that point of time is something which is uh, very uh, deliberately dramatized by Joyce over here. So first of all we see Mr. Deasy who is the headmaster who is about to pay uh, Stephen for his classes uh, and the conversation takes place inside his office. Uh, and you know so this is uh, you know a conversation with the headmaster and Stephen where he gives him the money uh, for his class and this should be on the screen. Um, you know, this is uh, a silver rain had been delivered to Stephen. A silver rain fell bright and knee on the soft pile of the tablecloth. Three, Mr. Deasy said, turning his little uh, savings box about in his hand. Uh, these are handy things to have. See, this is for silver rains. This is for the shillings, sixpences, half crowns, and here crowns. See, he shot from it two crowns and two shillings. Three, twelve, I, uh, he said. I think you'll find that's right. Thank you, sir, Stephen said, gathering the money together with shy haste and putting it in his pocket of his trousers. No thanks at all, Mr. Deasy said. You have earned it. Stephen's hand, free again, went back to the hollow shells, symbols too of beauty and power, a lump in my pocket, symbols soiled by greed and misery. Now, this is one of the uh, really interesting features of Ulysses in terms of how it manages to merge the materiality of life. Uh, and the effect produced out of materiality. So on the one hand we have a series of streams of consciousness where the characters go into reveries, they, they have daydreams, they move into different kinds of visions but at the same time they keep coming back to some very hardcore, sometimes filthy uh, material signifiers uh, and they fill the nest of Dublin is something which is never quite lost sight of uh, in its entire narrative. Uh, so we have this conversation taking place between the headmaster and Stephen, Stephen obviously being the employee of this, uh, of this institution. But at the same time we see him moving off in different directions in a reverie. So on the one hand he's getting money uh, from the headmaster but he's very conscious of his consciousness. And this metacognitive quality of being conscious of his consciousness is something which uh, both Dallas and Leopold Bloom exhibit in different degrees uh, and Ulysses which makes it such a phenomenal text despite a one day frame. We talked about how the one calendar day is a very superficial temporal structure within which different kinds of psychological times uh, are operative in different degrees crisscrossing each other sometimes. So he accepts the money and then he's very immediately aware of the symbolic significance of the money and the materiality of the money. At the same time he's feeling it in a very tactile kind of a way. So the tactility, the materiality, the earthiness uh, and the fill they all merge together uh, to produce this very complex effect uh, in Ulysses which is something which pervades the entire novel. Uh, and then of course Mr. Deasy would advise him further uh, before this gets more political and anti-Semitic and this is something I'm going to highlight a little bit in this section. Don't carry it like that, Mr. Deasy said. You'll pull it out somewhere and lose it. Just buy one of those machines. You'll find them very handy. Answer something. Uh, mine would often be empty, Stephen said. So this answer something is obviously uh, Stephen's head telling him uh, to do something. And this is a metacognitive quality I talked about. The aware of awareness, right, which is something that Ulysses uh, does very often, which is why it's such an important text of people working on cognition. Uh, people working on awareness, people working on consciousness. It's a brain telling you what to do, it's a mind telling you what to do, how to embody yourself, how to articulate yourself in certain social spaces. So what it does is it brings the entire idea of embodiment as a very complex act, a very complex activity. Because on the one hand embodiment is obviously a very embedded neural phenomenon but equally is an extended discursive phenomenon and this entanglement between the neural uh, embedded order and the discursive extended order is something which is very fractured in Ulysses. So the cognitive, the cognitive schema is very fractured in Ulysses. So we have characters telling themselves all the time, they're talking to themselves all the time as a result of which they end up being failed narrators quite often. Okay, uh, the same room and are the same wisdom and I the same three times now, three nooses around me here. Well, I can break them in an instant if I will. Before, because you don't save, Mr. Deasy said, pointing his finger. So the news figure is very important. And uh, Mr. Stevens' stream of consciousness telling him that this is uh, imprisonment. Uh, the school institution is uh, actually a prison house 
uh, of agency, a prison house, a will. And we saw the same uh, figure of the institution uh, curbing freedom, curbing agency, even in Dubliners. Uh, the short story which we did, uh, Araby, we found the entire story began with this institution um, setting the children free I mean, at the end of the school day, which is to suggest that they held them together as prisoners uh, you know, for the entirety of the day. So the news figures uh, are interesting. Every time Stephen enters his room to get paid, uh, he feels like he's uh, putting his head in the news uh, in the sense of being imprisoned by this institution. And obviously, Mr. Daisy over here, who's the headmaster, is the embodiment of the institution in terms of all his hierarchy and his uh, very rigid regime uh, to which he subjects his students to. Okay, because they don't save, and he's exhorting uh, Stephen now to save money. Uh, Mr. Deasy said, pointing his finger, you don't know yet what money is. Money is power. Uh, when you have lived as long as I have, I know, I know, but youth is, if youth but knee, but what does Shakespeare say? Put but money in thy purse. Iago, Stephen murmured. So this is, a, you know, this is like a knowledge game going on with the headmaster and Stephen. Uh, and Stephen uh, accurately said, this is from Othello, Iago. He lifted his gaze from the idle shelves to the old man's stare. He knew where money was, Mr. Daisy said. He made money, a poet, yes, but an Englishman too. Do you know what is the pride of the English? Do you know what, the, what is the proudest word you'll ever hear from an Englishman's mouth? Does he his ruler? His sea-cold eyes looked on an empty bay. Uh, it seems history is to blame on me and my words, unhating. That on, that on his empire, Stephen said, the sun never sets. Well, Mr. Daisy said, Mr. Daisy cried, that's not English, a French celt said that. He tapped his saving box against his thumbnail. I will tell you, he said solemnly, what is the proudest boast, I paid my way. So we can see two different kinds of knowledge and relatives that order. I mean, Stevens asks, what is the proudest thing an Englishman can say? And his immediate uh, uh, connect is with the empire. Right? And he says the proudest thing an Englishman can say in a very obnoxious way is that the sun never sets on the empire. But Mr. Deasy would beg to differ, and he, because he occupies a solemn position over here, a position of superiority, so he has ownership and knowledge, even though the knowledge may be fake and phony and not quite correct. So he says the proudest thing that the Englishman can say is I paid my way. Good man, good man, I paid my way. I never borrowed a shilling in my life. Can you feel that? I owe nothing. Can you? Mulligan, nine pounds, three pairs of socks, one pair of brooks, ties, Curran, ten guineas, McCann, one guinea, Fred, uh, Fred Ryan, two shillings, Temple, two lunches, Russell, one guinea, Cousins, ten shillings, Bob Reynolds, half a guinea, Quella, three guineas, Mrs. McCammon, five weeks' beard, the lumps they have is useless. So again, look at the way in which he moves on again, he shoots off into another reverie. The moment he talks about, uh, he hears about borrowing and owing money, he has an entire rattle in his brain about the amount of money he owes to different kinds of people, the money and the different other objects he owes to people. So again, look at the way in which the very hardcore, filthy materiality of Dublin uh, is actually juxtaposed together with the abstraction of consciousness, which is never quite let loose. It's very much part of the materiality, which makes Joyce uh, such a phenomenal writer in the sense of how he navigates consciousness along with material markers. Right, so these material markers are actually part of the consciousness, part of the abstraction. So we have, on the other hand, uh, a very hard go material, filthy figures, the money, socks, dirty things, linen, for instance. And on the other hand, we have this uh, streams of consciousness gurgling out, as it were, out of this material markers, uh, which is a very interesting combination of materiality and abstraction, which is something I talked about already. So the entire effect, the entire consciousness in Dublin over here in Ulysses is a combination or emerges from the combination of materiality and abstraction. Okay, so for the moment to know, Stephen answered, Mr. Deasy laughed with a rich delight put him back his savings box. I knew you wouldn't, he said joyously, but one day you must feel it. We are a generous people, but we must also be just. I fear those big words, Stephen said, which make us so unhappy. Mr. Deasy st stared sternly for some moments over the mantelpiece uh, at the shapely bulk of a man in tartan filibex, Albert Edward, uh, Prince of Wales. You think of me as an old foggy and an old Tory, his thoughtful voice said. I saw three generations since O'Connell's time. I remember the famine in 1946, a reference to the potato famine over here. Do you know what the Orange Lodges agitated for repeal of the United 20 years before O'Connell did or before the prelates of a communion denounced him as a demagogue? Your Fenians forget some things. Glorious pious and immortal memory, the lodge of diamond in arming in a splendid behang with copses of papishes, hose, marks and armed, the planter's covenant, the black north and the true blue bible, croppies lie down. So we have again this different kinds of markers coming in and we have a kind of a 
contest going on about history. And uh, Mr. Dizioway, who claims to be, uh, you know, more knowledgeable, he, you know, he's getting a bit defensive because he thinks Stephen attacks him for being a Tory, for being a pro-establishment person. Whereas Stephen over here, as a young artist, as a young poet, he has a subversive imagination at place. So we have two different kinds of masculinity also in order over here. Now let's cut into uh, the really interesting section over here. Uh, where you know, you know, Dizzy talked about uh, you know, the uh, Jews in England and how uh, he talks about the entire Jewish presence as a pathological presence um, you know, in England and how England is obviously getting degenerated because of the Jews. Right? So this is something which uh, we'll spend some time with. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so this is uh, this should be on the screen, and uh, this is a part of the very strong anti-Semitic sentiment that Ulysses exhibits, uh, which is obviously a reflection of the anti-Semitic sentiments in Dublin, uh, of Joyce's Dublin at that point of time. Mark my words, Mr. Dedalus, he said, England is in the hands of the Jews in all the highest places, her finance, her press, and they are the other signs of nations decay. Wherever they gather, they eat up the nation's vital strength. I have seen it coming these years. As sure as we are standing here, the, Jews, the Jew merchants are already at the work of destruction. All England is dying. Right? So we have this entire sentiment of the uh, anti-Semitic anti -Semitic, uh, feeling coming in very strongly. And of course, uh, this is not something foreign to England as well. I mean, the only Jewish prime minister at that point in time before uh, you know, this particular historical time was Benjamin Disraeli, and he too was seen as a figure, uh, this corrupting pathological presence uh, to the English imagination. And this anti-Semitic thing, uh, which, which is rampant in 19th century literature also, we find if you read something like Bram Stoker's Dracula, we find that the physiognomy of Dracula, the vampire comes and sucks away the blood of England, uh, is very, very Semite, uh, stereotypically Semite in quality, in terms of all the racist rhetoric around the figure of the vampire. So, you know, in Dracula, uh, the fear, the real figure, fear in Dracula is not about blood infection. It's about unregulated capitalism. The, the count with uh, this unlimited wealth comes and buys of everything in England, and that's the real fear in Dracula. Uh, it's dramatized by Bram Stoker. So you have a similar kind of sentiment over here as well, where, uh, you know, this headmaster of an educational institution, uh, which is the irony over here, uh, he's telling a, a young uh, school teacher that England is degenerating because of the Jews. So you have a similar kind of a xenophobic feeling at work which is being articulated in a very mainstream institutional way. Okay, he stepped uh, swiftly off, his eyes come into blue life as it passed over the pass of a broad sunbeam. He faced about and back again, dying, he said again, if not dead by now. His eyes opened wide and vision stared sternly across the sunbeam in which he halted. A merchant, Stephen said, is one who buys cheap and sells dear, Jew or Gentile, is he not? So Stephen's uh, very meek defense is uh, interesting over here. He says, and they're all businessmen. It doesn't matter the Jews are gentle. A merchant is someone who buys cheaply and sells dearly. Uh, it's a profit-making enterprise. It doesn't matter who is Jew and who isn't. They sinned against the light, Mr. Deasy said gravely, and you can see uh, the darkness in their eyes, and that is why they are wanderers on the earth to this day. So again, the whole idea of the persecution of the Jews is something which is seen as a rightful retribution for having disobeyed the God, and as a result of which they are wandering even today. Right? So this is very, very uh, mainstream, very institutional articulation of uh, anti-Semiticism, which is being said. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, the whole idea of history is uh, you know, given in a very quasi half chopped logical way with knowledge used very strategically. Uh, and in response to which Stephen says, History, Stephen said, is a nightmare from which I'm trying to wake. This is a very oft quoted line from Ulysses, but this is obviously part of the, you know, the entire historical uh, narrative that Ulysses is trying to present. Uh, it's a very deeply political novel, and we have different kinds of narrative strains that play over here. And obviously, if you read the entire novel, you find the, the irony over here, and the reason why it's so political is because the protagonist of Ulysses happens to be a Jew. Leopold Bloom is a Jew, uh, an Irish Jew, and, and that obviously forms part of his identity uh, in a very massive way. So he is someone, Bloom, we'll come to Bloom later in the next lecture. We find that Bloom is obviously trying to navigate his way through a very anti Semitic Dublin, uh, which makes his entire identity quite political in quality as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> From the playfield, the boys uh, raised a shout, a whirring whistle, goal. What is, what is the nightmare gave you back a kick? The ways of the Creator are not our ways, Mr. Deasy said. All human history moved towards one great goal, the manifestation of God. Stephen jerked his thumb towards the window, saying, that is God. Hooray, aye, hooray, what, Mr. Deasy asked. A shout in the street, Stephen answered, shrugging his shoulders. 
Okay, so the whole idea of God is being uh, um, described in a very interesting way. Stephen said that God happens to be a shelf in the street. God is an act of randomness. Uh, God is an act of accident sometimes. God is an act of joy, a shriek in, of joy in the streets, which is completely the, um, the ontological opposite of any institutional understanding of uh, uh, God and uh, you know, the whole idea of deification, which is embodied by this institution over here. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, Mr. Deasy goes on to say, I'm happier than you are. He said, we have committed many errors and many sins. A woman brought sin into the world. For a woman who was no better than he, she, should, she should be, Helen, the runaway wife of Menelaus, ten years a Greeks met war on Troy. A faithless wife first brought the strangers to our shore here. So again, the reference to Helen is interesting, uh, and the reference to the faithless wife is also interesting because we find there's a faithless wife here as well. Someone is being unfaithful to a husband, um, you know, Molly Bloom over here, uh, who's, who's modeled on uh, the entire idea of Penelope, uh, the original Greek narrative, the Greek myth. Uh, that is mimicked over here. So the whole idea of faithlessness is being parodied, uh, especially if it comes from a, uh, you know, uh, someone who's embodiment of institutions such as Mr. Daisy. Okay, so uh, I'll just wind up now with this section coming to an end, where Stephen obviously doesn't want to engage uh, uh, with Mr. Daisy anymore. Uh, so he goes off uh, running errands for him, uh, and as he's about to depart, this real drama takes place. Uh, he finds Mr. Deasy coming after him in order to say him, uh, tell him the right finishing line, the, the, the signing off sentence. So what did that be? I just wanted to say, he said, Ireland, they say, has the honor of being the only country which has never persecuted the Jews. Do you know why? Do you know that? No. And do you know why? He frowned sternly on the bright air. Why, sir? Stephen asked, began to smile. Because she never let them in, Mr. Deasy said solemnly. A cough bowl of laughter leaped from his dr throat, dragging it uh, after it a rattling chain of phlegm. He turned back quickly, coughing, laughing, his lifted arms waving to the air. She never let them in. He cried again through his laughter as he stamped on gaitered feet over the gravel of the path. That's why, on his wise shoulders, to the checker work of leaves, the sun flung spangles, dancing coins. So again, look at the coin imagery in the end, which stands for the signifier of greed, which is normally associated with the Jews over here. And here, obviously, it's transferred over to the anti-Semite uh, in a very, very symbolic kind of a way. And also this entire idea, the cough, the phlegm, the congestion uh, is part of the disease metaphor that Joyce is trying to describe over here. So the real disease lies in anti-Semitism, not in the Semites over here, uh, which is quite clearly uh, which is quite clearly apparent over here. And obviously, uh, you know, Stephen doesn't want to engage with them because he's an employee, a lowly employee of this institution. Uh, but Joyce, the narrator over here, is very clearly telling us that the entire disease of anti-Semitism is what pervades Dublin at this point in time. And the final image of dancing coins is obviously quite symbolic and it's a bit of a tell away a uh, giveaway to the entire idea of greed which is located not in a Jew but in the anti-Semite uh, as embodied by the headmaster of this religious institution. So I'll stop at this point today but this is a very short section but which nonetheless uh, gives a sense of the political picture of Dublin at that point in time, the racist picture of Dublin at that point in time in which navigates the uh, uh, central protagonist Leopold Bloom with which we'll begin the next lecture. Thank you for your attention.